Chapter 22. The First Battle, Carnage, and a Valorous Weasel. How Chanticleer crowed then. He ripped his eyes from this cockatrice he had never seen before. He heard one low guttural laugh below the hissing. Then he turned attention to his warriors and crowed with a will. The battle began. Over the wall the red ants streamed like pouring sand. They went among the basilisks and bit. It was a stinging bite, but every ant, when he had bitten flesh, died. Yet his body clung to the place where he had bitten. The serpents writhed. The hissing became a screaming and a curse. They waited no longer. Serpents flowed forward to meet the attack. Now the warriors of size burst over the wall, crying, galloping, roaring, raging. Great animals raised a battle cry. They tossed their heads, they thundered their hooves among the serpents, black blood spurted onto the land. But the larger serpents doubled themselves with taut violence. They fired themselves into the air, arrows. They flung their bodies like ropes around the necks of these animals. They squeezed tight until the necks broke and the noses ran red blood. Small animals took the serpents into their mouths and whipped their heads back and forth to snap the backs of the enemy. But then they spun in circles, shrieking as the serpent's poison burned through their bodies. The birds swooped down from the air, vicious claws open, piercing, breaking the flesh of the serpents. The foxes beat left and right with sticks, leaping backward whenever a serpent drew near enough to touch. Their sticks dripped black blood and smoked. The foxes were quick. They used their tails to turn corners at a sharp angle. When a serpent reared at them, they snapped their tails left, and then left with their whole bodies, and the passing stick cut another in two. But the basilisks made sharp points of their own tails. They sprang from the earth and sailed through the air, tail first, like darts. They stabbed the hearts of many creatures. The smallest serpents stung furry animals between their toes. Then these animals would curl into shivering balls and plead for someone to chop their feet away. Others clawed at their own skulls until the skin flapped because the poison had ascended to their brains. The sheep had thick woolen protection all over their bodies, but their eyes were open. The basilisks flew at their eyes. The otters fought together. The weasels fought, each one of them alone, but the weasels fought. Most furious and deadly and courageous of all. So fast their sudden speed across the ground, so quick their cut and their retreat that the serpents could not watch for them. The rabbits were there. That alone was their courage. They died easily under the serpent's bite, legs jerking as they did. The battle was a long one. The field ran wet with blood, both black and red, so that the animals slipped in it, and some who lost their footing came to grief. Oh, there was a screaming and a busy grunting on every hand across the plain. Animals went forward with their shoulders hunched, their heads down, their eyes stern and dirty. Everywhere the serpents slithered, hissed, and bit innumerable. And Chanticleer heard it all from the top of his coop. He saw it all from his high place. The tears broke from his eyes and he wept. But yet he crowed, and he crowed as though his heart would break. Hatred, God's curse, sorrow, and God's speed, he crowed together in a constant burning beauty. The crow's potens. And never once, never once in all that time did he take his eyes from the battlefield. Then a small figure came to the top of the wall. He came from the bloody plain. Once on the wall, he turned and stared at the fighting. He was breathing hard, winded, but soon his breath came in strange jerks. His whole body began to quiver and shake. After a moment, he threw back his head, and it could be seen that his mouth was wide open. It was John Wesley Weasel, and he was laughing. Ooh, he laughed. Is going, going, cut for cut, kill for kill. Servants want fighting? Hoopla! Ha <laughs> ha! Gets fighting! Furry little buggers knows how to fight, eh? He thrust the air a couple of times with his legs. Then he turned and came down into the camp. There was blood on the left side of his head. It matted the fur, and a swelling had closed his left eye. Also, his left ear was gone. 
He had lost it to the battle, and now he came for salve to stop the bleeding. If he lost too much of his blood, he would become useless to the fight, and that would have greatly irritated the weasel. Ho, Chanticleer! Ho, Lord Chanticleer! He called as he neared the coop. The rooster sees the way it goes! Chanticleer thought, yes, I see the many dying. See the slaughter? But he was crowing heart-bloody crows and could not answer the weasel. Is blackguards, Chanticleer! Is filthy blackguards from hell! We kill them! W's makes the field stink with them! They kill us, Chanticleer thought behind his crowing, savagely. Crow, Lord Chanticleer! The weasel cried buoyantly. Crow like Judgment Day! Here's you! He cried, and he went into the coop by the widow's back door. In the minute while he was gone, Chanticleer saw a deer go down to his knees in the vermilion mud. The deer Nimbus raised his face to heaven, and then he died without a word. There was a serpent lodged in his breast. Chanticleer crowed. He crowed and crowed. Suddenly he felt the coop tremble beneath him. Though he was crowing loudly, yet he heard a storm of shocked, painful curses come from down below. Immediately he thought of Perlote inside, but he couldn't leave his place, and he couldn't stop his crowing. Then John Wesley burst out of the back hole, a writhing serpent in his mouth. John Wesley slammed the serpent violently against the coop. Again and again he whirled the serpent until the body ruptured and spewed black blood everywhere. And still he battered the ragged body with great blows. He tore at the dead flesh. He dug at it with blinding speed and with loathing. He stood back. God! God! he cried, wringing his paws. Then he ran back into the hole. This was the basilisk, which had hidden itself in Ocelotta's body. This one had waited his time before sliding into the very coop of Chanticleer. John Wesley came out of the hole again, tenderly bearing the body of the wee widow mouse. He walked to the coop door and he stood there crying, Perlote! Perlote! Come see what they've done! He cried, Chanticleer, this is what they're doing! What does mice do? Mice cleans in the springs! Mice wears aprons and sweeps! But the the damned damned he said no more. Pertolote came to the door. She took the dead widow from the weasel. He said, see what they are doing! He stood and watched while Pertolote found a place for the widow within the coop. Then he filled his lungs to cracking and he screamed, do and do and do! John Wesley will do for you! In a flash he had cleared the ground between the coop and the wall. Up and over the wall he sped. He leaped the trench and threw himself bodily into the war. How the weasel fought then. Here was a serpent raising its head. John Wesley shot by and took the head with him. Here a serpent flew through the air. John Wesley darted off the ground, caught it, and when they hit the ground again, the serpent was dead, bleeding at the eyes. Here was a tangle of serpents all leached to a fox's back. With a cry, John Wesley pounced. He snapped and slaughtered them all. John Wesley was faster and more fierce than fire. He pierced through the battlefield, crying, Do and do and do! On the left hand, he killed a hundred as if they were paper. On the right, he killed five hundred. Many, many perished before him, but he was not enjoying his carnage. He was enraged. Do and do and do for what you have done! The animals saw his stark fury, and they took courage. They roared. They turned every one of them and pressed a wild attack toward the river. The serpents hissed and tried to meet this thundering wall. The river belched forth bales of ready basilisks, but the animals were convinced serpents could die. As one mighty beast with John Wesley at its head, the animals came forward, killing, dying, and killing. Chanticleer crowed. He crowed lustily. He stood on the tips of his toes. He stretched his neck and crowed almighty power to his warriors. Children! Another voice. Another scream. Not Chanticleer's. Suddenly the rooster was gaping. He saw his mirror on the other side of the field. He saw the scaly serpentine cockatrice. Children! Cockatrice put out his wide wings and lunged into the air. Higher and higher he circled, his tail curling out behind him, ascending until he was at a point above the fighting weasel. Then he dived. John Wesley Weasel! Chanticleer shrieked. 
The weasel dodged, but Cockatrice only skimmed the ground and rose up again on his great wings. Again he gained height, then stooped and dived again at the weasel. He aimed his tail from underneath his body like a stinger. John Wesley scrambled. He raced back and forth. There was no fighting for him now, only the running to escape. Down came Cockatrice, a bolt of lightning. His tail opened up a wound on the weasel's side, and again he soared up to the white sky. The weasel was busy running. The battlefield was nothing but flat open places, no place to hide, no time to dig. Just running, dodging, and running again while Cockatrice screamed out of the sky yet a third time. Suddenly the weasel felt very tired. He thought that he would stop running soon. Animals and basilisks both had ceased their fighting. Basilisks because their numbers had been decimated. Those left were slipping toward the river. Animals because they were horrified by the scene before them and helpless. On a whim, Chanticleer looked to his right. There, far away across the plain, he saw Mundo Kani coming, head down, beating the earth with his feet, running. Oh, run, dog, the rooster crowed. Run, run! Mundo Kani had seen the trouble. Again, Cockatrice was falling from the white sky like an arrow. The weasel was bustering around the field, veering left and right to make a difficult target of himself. But if this caused trouble for the dropping Cockatrice, it also troubled the dog. Mundokani was fast flat out. Already he had halved the distance, but how could he veer with the weasel? Russell's bush! Oh, whoops. <clears throat> Russell's bush! He roared to the weasel without slowing his course. John Wesley stopped dead, looked at him surprised. Run! screamed the dog. Oh, John, run! Cockatrice was taking level aim. The weasel ran. He made a pattern of his sudden jagged running. He glanced at the dog, gauged his speed, and then stared at the place where the bush used to be. From the top of the coop, Chanticleer saw a dog of enormous speed and a weasel of quick turns close in on one another. At a certain spot they met, and then the weasel was no longer visible. Cockatrice drove himself into a lump of earth. Mundukani made a wide, pounding circle and returned to camp. Home! Home! Come home! Chanticleer raised his voice again to cry retreat to his animals. It was time. Home! 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 And they came. Shaggy, sad, small and stumbling, they came. In the instant of the retreat, insufferably weary, dragging, shambling, hurrying more against their fatigue than from the enemy, stunned, they streamed back the dog foremost of them all. They mounted the wall and fell into the camp, damp, sick, sorry, and alive. The day was ending. The hot day was nearly over. The night was at hand. Here and there on the camp floor lay the broken animals, too tired even to consider that the battle had been theirs. They slept and did not sleep at once. Just, they were there. And that was all, inert. Chanticleer, still on the top of the coop, gazed at them and choked on his love for them. The strain of the day had left him soft toward his animals. And while he looked, he heard a very weak but bitter voice nearby the coop. The voice said, Tell a dog to put me down. John's wet he is. In spite of himself, Chanticleer let slip a sudden stupid giggle. Then in a manner more grave, Mundo Kani, it's over for a day, don't you know? It's ways to bite a weasel, the weasel said, and then he passed out. He looked like a wet rag hanging out of either side of the dog's mouth. Blood dripped from the point of his nose and from his tail. All this time you've been standing there, Chanticleer wondered for it had been a while gone as the animals found their places inside the camp. Mundokani's eyes were filled with anguish. They looked mournfully up to the rooster. Who knew how kindly the dog's tongue was licking John Wesley's wound on the inside of his mouth? Well, the dog laid the weasel gently on the earth and sighed. Shot to clear! Like an arrow, iron arrow, the cry came to him. 
Chanticleer spun around. He saw the battlefield moist and glutted. He saw wreckage. He saw bodies in which there was no life. The field everywhere was still. So who called to him? Chanticleer! Proud Chanticleer! From across the entire battlefield came the poisoned voice. Standing on an invisible island out in the flooding river, river Chanticleer's mirror was crying challenge. Cockatrice. His tail twisted powerfully and dashed the water as he called. His red eye watched the rooster unblinking. His voice was slamming into Chanticleer's face. What are animals? No account. What is a battle? One with numbers. Nothing. What is a commander who hides behind a wall? Let the commander show himself tomorrow. Cockatrice will meet him, and him will Cockatrice kill. Chanticleer's mirror slipped into the water and disappeared. Chanticleer watched that place until the ripples had played themselves out and the river became smooth in the evening. Battles, battles, how many to make a war? And when you have won one, then what have you won? The beautiful Pertilote stepped out of the coop and looked up at her husband. He didn't see her. He was grieving. He was listening. Another voice arose from the soil itself, a voice confident and mild. It said, Behold the rooster who suffers much more than he must. Ah, Chanticleer, Chanticleer, why do you suffer today and tomorrow? Oozed the compassionate voice. Curse God, curse him, and all will be done. Or lest you forget the truth of things, remember, I am worm, and I am here. And then, finally, it was the night. Chapter 23. We Fight Against a Mystery. Before and after, and a battle in between. The night before the battle had crackled with energy and fear, but this night afterward fell loose to the ground in exhaustion. Animals took no care where or how they lay. They sprawled everywhere. Here and there a head rose from the ground, snapping at the air. A cry trembled on the night. A leg began to thrum and jerk violently. Once John Wesley Weasel begged vengeance for the death of the wee widow mouse, then Pertilote sang to him and soothed him back into silence. But silent or screaming, neither one made any difference to the weasel because he was sleeping and did not know what he was doing. As if it were the earth itself underneath them all, or the winds around them all, a groaning never ceased the whole night through. This was the voice of the wounded. They could not take breath or release it except in pain. Even as they slept, they groaned. From the, from the top of the coop, at the right time, Chanticleer crowed a short, bitter compline, very much like a growl. And when the ceremony was done, the rooster too was done. In silence, he descended from the coop. He walked among his animals, climbed the wall, turned once to look the whole camp over, then disappeared down the other side. The night was not altogether dark. Some grim, shadowy light touched things, so Pertilote had seen the rooster leave. She had been watching him ever since the retreat, never saying a word or asking one of Chanticleer. But now she felt a deep compulsion to follow him outside the camp. She knew that he wasn't coming back in again. Today, all the warriors had fought, Tomorrow it would be Chanticleer alone. This knowledge had driven him out, for already he was effecting a separation between himself and them. This knowledge he carried while he wandered through the stiff field beyond the ditch. And this same knowledge drew Pertilote's heart after the singular rooster. She followed Chanticleer's path among the animals toward the wall. She climbed the wall and made ready to go over, just as Chanticleer had done. 
She tried, but in that moment, for the first time, her courage failed her. She stood still. Poor Pertolote. For a long time that night she struggled with herself, hesitating between the camp and the battlefield, loathing herself and yet loving her life too dearly to trust it to the darkness. Some light there was, to be sure, but it was the darkness, the nothingness in front of her which struck fear into her soul. The light which so thinly illuminated this night came not from the sky, but from the river itself. Strange light. A smoky glow hovered just above the water. A softly flowing sheet of bloodless light stretched as far as the river went. It was light barely seen, fatuous fire, but it was enough to make the battlefield seem a black, bottomless pit. That pit, that mouth in the earth, that's what frightened the hen. She knew perfectly well that there was firm land under the blackness, and yet she feared that once off the wall she would fall and fall forever. Strange light, stranger darkness, and the warm familiar camp behind, this was the confusion, the struggle which rooted Pertolote's poor feet to the wall and would not set her free to fly. Oh, but somewhere in the darkness was her husband, her Chanticleer. Chanticleer, she whined softly. At least she thought it had been soft, but he must have heard her. Get back, he barked, bodiless in the night. You've got no business up there, Pertolote. Get back into the camp. That broke the spell. Her first impulse was to focus on his voice, to know where he was, but her second impulse was the swifter. It was to become suddenly, hotly angry with the rooster, and at the third impulse, Pertolote took to her wings and flew straight away from the wall. Instantly the wall, the camp, the animals, the coop, and everything else was swallowed up in darkness. She came from nothing, she flew over nothing, there was nothing ahead of her. She felt no motion in the flying because nothing showed her that she moved. Only there was the dim, smiling light above the river, white, shapeless, smooth, and soft. That was the only something in all the world around her. All the rest was chasm. All the rest was pit, horrible, hopeless blackness. Ah, God, she said, stabbed with panic at her foolishness, beating her useless wings. Where was she to go? She tried to fly straight up, but suddenly she herself was nothing any more. For one small second between wing beats, she truly thought she had died. Pertolote, you fool! Chanticleer's voice. Again, it broke her. She simply quit flying, folded her wings, fell out of the air, and hit the earth. I told you, didn't I? I said you had no business out here. This isn't for you, idiot. Not for anybody else. I'm the one. Where are you? Pertolote tried to stand up on shaky legs and slipped the bloody earth. She did stand up. And then she stood stock still, looking around. Some shapes on the ground were coming visible to her, though they were only blacker forms in the darkness. This was a foreign land, and she was very lonely in it. All right, then, Chanticleer shouted. Where are you? Let's get it over with and be done. He was quiet a moment, and then, Pertolote, for God's sake, where are you? I'm here, she said. Where? I, I don't know. Here. I'm coming to you, he shouted, and she nodded. There was a long silence, and then Chanticleer shouted from a different place, Listen! How am I supposed to know where you are? Make a noise! Here, Pertolote said. How terribly lonely she felt. Good! Keep it up! Here, 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 she repeated, sing song. The word grew ridiculous in her mouth. Hear, hear, hear. Maybe to give it some meaning, maybe to make a responsible adult of herself once again, Pertolote started to walk. Whether toward the camp to avoid the rooster or toward Chanticleer himself, she did not know. Her loneliness in this place was stunning her. The ground was uneven, and the darkness around her feet total. She tripped. Her face slithered into the mud. 
She lifted up her head, sick with the smell of blood. Her eyes saw a dim sight, and she was horrified. Two inches away from her own face was the open mouth of a deer, neither speaking nor breathing. It was open as in a scream, but it screamed no sound at all. The deer was dead. Pertolote gagged, stumbled to her feet, and backed away. Again she slipped and fell, this time to rise from the mud, gasping like someone drowning. She plunged away, and Chanticleer grabbed her. Now, he said, you tell me what you're doing out here. For one moment the hen was rigid. In the next she seized Chanticleer and drove him with an incredible force back toward the deer. Loneliness had split open in rage. What's his name? she demanded. What? Chanticleer was overwhelmed. I don't know, he said. I can't see. Pertolote pushed him closer. Touch him. Feel his face. Tell me his name. But he's dead. I don't care, the hen fairly screamed. I want to know his name. Chanticleer reached through the darkness and felt the deer. He drew back then, until he was standing right next to Pertolote. In a stricken voice, he said, Nimbus, Nimbus, cried the hen. His name is Nimbus. Nimbus, too, is dead. Perlote, Chanticleer tried to say, but she spun away from him. I will give you my children. I'll sit with a suffering fox. I'll pat you a weasel. I'll sing to him. I'll even watch you leave the camp without a word to me, and I will endure. Stop! Listen to me. You will go out, and you will fight with cockatrice, and you will die, and I will endure. This is the way that it is. You choose. Fox, weasel, chanticleer, lord and rooster, you all of you choose, and I am born to endure. But who is Nimbus? Oh, God, why does he have to die? Pertolote, I didn't. Let it end, chanticleer. With Nimbus, let it end right there. He's the last sacrifice, the most stupid. Nobody knows who Nimbus is. Well, then he's a child to me, my husband and my father, and he's the last that I'm going to give. Chanticleer put a foolish wing around her shoulder. You can't talk this way, not now. But Pertolote wrenched herself free. Get away from me, you. You've already left me, so... You've gone to fight the cockatrice, my lord. You're dead already. So, so I go to more Nimbus. She began to run through the darkness. Chanticleer made no attempt to stop her, nor even to follow her. But his head fell back and he wailed in pain. Pertolote! Immediately, as if shot, Pertolote collapsed. Right where she was in the muddy field, she began to weep loudly. And the sobs were ripped from her soul like roots from the earth, and Pertolote cried, Oh, Chanticleer. And so he came to her, and this time she let him hold her. Among all the black forms on the battlefield, these two made one small incidental lump, but this was a living lump. That was the difference. After an age had passed, Chanticleer said, Pertolote, I love you. I can't do it any more, Chanticleer, she said gently in her own voice. Twice I've seen the basilisks, twice the destruction, and cockatrice. He never, never goes away. I'm tired, Chanticleer. So am I, he said. I thought we won today, but I thought I won nine months ago when I fled by the river. Marriage and our children, I thought these were victories. But Cockatrice came back, and he comes back, and he comes back, and now he wants you to. There should be an ending. There will be. But what kind of an ending? You will die, and then what? When will I die? Oh, God, I should have died a year ago. Perlote, it's not written that I must die. So you say, so you say, Chanticleer, you have never been close to cockatrice. God help me, I have. To this, 
Chanticleer had no answer whatever. He held his peace. She said, Who is Worm? Chanticleer said truthfully, I don't know. Pertolote made the question more difficult. Why is Worm? She said. Chanticleer began to chuckle, and the hen was surprised. <laughs> Ask me why is Mundukani's nose, he said. I don't know why that boot was born into the world, but there it is. I don't know, Pertolote, I don't know. What is Worm? She asked. Oh, Pertolote, have I seen him? Do I know his father or his mother? Has he told me his shape or his purpose? Has God ever explained to me what lives beneath our feet or why he permits it to be? I've asked him often enough, Lord knows, but he never answers. Worm is. How shall I say what worm is? Beyond everything else we fight against, there is worm. Beyond the basilisks, deeper even than cockatrice. Worm. Even so, it seems to be. Then we fight against a mystery, she said. Yes, he said. And she said, Chanticleer, I am so very tired. The loose light above the river rolled and seemed to form itself into shapes, grinning, confident faces billowing across the water. Against that unholy light, Pertolote saw Chanticleer's silhouette. Then her thoughts passed from herself to him, for she saw how sadly low his head was bent, and Pertolote was changed. Chanticleer? What? And I love you. Now the rooster found a fine hold on her body and squeezed her so tightly that she grunted. Oh, Chanticleer, I have such a very little faith, she said. But you came out to this wretched place, he said. Who else came out to find me? She searched to see his eyes and failed. Only his comb, like a crown, was visible against the river's light. Do you forgive me? Ah, the lady with a flaming throat who sings like the spheres, who weeps and sings again, the lady who endures forever. She asks me whether I forgive. He touched her gently. What else is there, Bertolote? I forgive. Will you fight with Cockatrice tomorrow, she asked. Perhaps she finally wanted all things properly in place by his speaking them. It was an honest question. Yes, he said. Such a thing is possible. Such a thing will be. I am not going back into the camp until I have fought him. You have chosen against evil. I have. And perhaps my husband will die for his choice. Even so, he said, we fight against a mystery.